Hello and welcome back to the Ascent Cycling Podcast. Today we have another preview, team preview ahead of the 2021 season. And today we're focusing on Astana Premier Tech, a team who've made quite a few changes going into 2021. 2020 was the season they accomplished a fair few good results. They of course won a monument at Il Lombardia, a few stages at the Tour de France as well. I'm here alongside Guillaume. Why don't you go through their 2020 results and how do you think they did in 2020 as a whole? Well, I think Astana has had a very, very interesting season um, with one rider that had, in my opinion, a breakthrough, Alexander Vlasov, uh, getting a stage um, on the Tour de la Provence, uh, winning the Mont Ventoux de Nivelle Challenge, I believe, winning, I think, in the Giro d'Emilia and also being very present during Il Lombardia's win of uh, Jakob Fulsang. But overall, they did well. Miguel Lopez winning one of the most important stages on the Tour de France at the Col de la Loze. Uh, Yonis Aguirre winning on his own Grand Tour. Uh, Lutsenko as well, doing very well on the Tour de France. And also won national title uh, with Luis Leon Sanchez in quite an interesting manner uh, with Jesus Serrada having uh, bike issues in the final 500 meters of the race. Uh, but overall, a season that you would expect from Astana with their main riders uh, getting the wins. Um, I mean, there's there's no weak riders, uh, quote unquote, that won last year. Potentially, I, I guess Fabio Felline and uh, Luis Leon would be the the weakest one uh, out of the bunch. But a very very solid season last year for the uh, Kazakh outfit. I think their major result last year was for sure Il Lombardia, a race they definitely would have targeted in the build up to the Giro, taking both Fusang and Vlasov to the race. And of course, Remco's crash may have contributed to that. Who knows what Remco could have done had he not crashed on the descent in that race. But anyhow, a really, really strong showing by Fulsang to take his second monument of his career um, in the last two seasons as well, I believe. He's really making a habit of that in recent times. So who knows whether he can do that going into 2021. I'm sure we'll discuss that a little later on the pod. Like he said, Alex Vlasov was the real shining point for Astana last season. Breaking through, it was his first season as a World Tour professional after signing from Gazprom. A plethora of really good results. He uh, started the Giro d'Italia but had to abandon after the first stage. Uh, He wasn't feeling too well but he was close to a top 10 at the Vuelta and I think really did improve as the race went on and showed himself to be one of the best climbers at the race on some of the steeper climbs as well. He was second on the Angleroo, one of the steepest climbs in cycling. So Vlasov for sure, really, really good signing uh, for Astana last season. And it would definitely be interesting to see if he can push on this season. It was a rider I had not expected to perform, uh, at least not at this level. Uh, he missed out on the top 10 of La Volta by two seconds to veteran Alejandro Valverde. Uh, but yeah, he did seem very, very good towards the, the latter part of, of the race as well, doing well at the Alto de la Farapona. Um, and he is only 24, which is important to mention, uh, as um, we haven't touched a lot upon the uh, the transfers of Astana yet. But one rider might have left the team um, and therefore making Alessandro Vlasov the new GC guy. Uh, and we will talk about that um, in a few but uh, yeah, a very decent season, a very decent showing by um, by the Russian. And as you said, Fulsang, um, just showing that despite his age, the man can still win. He certainly can. And 15 wins as a whole for the team over the year. They didn't really compete for a grand tour. I know Lopez was on the podium in the final days of the Tour de France. He dropped well off, as we know, on the time trial. I think they'll be looking to push on a little bit into 21 in terms of their number of wins and perhaps their competitiveness as well in the GC of the Grand Tours. I think they'll be pretty disappointed if they don't finish on the podium this season. And I actually did attend the Astana uh, team presentation earlier this week. And I know Alex Vinokorov, who works um, as a manager and as a director for the team, did aim to win a Grand Tour this season. And he also put a target down of 30 race wins up from the 15 from last season. Of course, there was the pandemic last year, which can be uh, attributed to some of uh, the lack of wins last season. But 30 wins and a Grand Tour win is what Alexander Vinokurov is aiming for in 2021. It's ambitious. 
um, but they've made quite a few transfers as well, which could well help them do that. It is indeed ambitious, and uh, taking a first look at their transfers, I'm not sure if the target is achievable, um, because they have lost their main rider, their, the face of Astana. Miguel Angel Lopez has indeed departed the Kazakh outfit to go and uh, join Movistar. Movistar depleted uh, of their Colombian GC leaders last season with Nero Quintana going to Arca and Richard Carapaz going to Ineos. Um, Lopez not exactly replaced in the sense that Vlasov obviously took his place in a way in uh, the hierarchy of climbers with uh, with Astana. They've also lost uh, Lorenz de Vries who joins Alpes in Phoenix, uh, two Kazakhs in Daniel Fomenik and Zandos Bezegitov who I believe is now going to be a director sportif for um, for Astana Premier Tech and Hernando Barques which I uh, do not know where the Colombian has gone. Talking about their signings, uh, the focus has been put solely on uh, young riders um, getting some riders from Vino Astana Motors, which is the uh, young team or the um, youth team, I believe, of Astana with the likes of Yevgeny Fedorov and Gleb Brusensky. Um, they've also strengthened themselves with some riders from NCT as the team was potentially about to fold, uh, getting the two Italians in Samuele Battistella and Matteo Sobrero. Uh, which we'll speak a bit later on about, and uh, also South African Stefan de Bod. And finally, the additions of Javier Romo, the uh, Spanish under-23 road champion, and finally the rider from Colpac Balan, Andrea Piccolo. And obviously meant Ecuadorian for Richard Carapath. Uh, definitely not Colombian, right? Please do not hate me. Thank you. So yeah, their big loss for sure in their transfers is, of course, Superman Lopez going to... The bunch of idiots, I think he branded them as at the 2019 Vuelta. Um, after calling Movistar idiots at the 2019 Vuelta, he apparently a year later has forgotten all about that and goes to join the Spanish outfit. To be fair, on paper, it does make sense, I think, from both a Movistar and Miguel Angel Lopez perspective. Uh, they're lacking a GC le leader, as we mentioned, but it does really give room for Alex Vlasov to really grow in this team. I think we'll talk about him a little more in detail later in the podcast. But looking at their signings, very similar to Lotto Sudao, who we mentioned in a previous podcast, they focus very much on younger riders. Um, and to be honest, I don't know too much about all of these guys. I know Battistella, Sobrero and Stefan de Bod all come from NTT Pro Cycling. It looked like they may be folding uh, towards the end of 2020. Of course, they're now becoming Quebec at Assos and those guys had already made the move to Astana in search for a new contract and those three guys I think are definitely the pick of the bunch for me in their incomings for Astana Premier Tech. Battistella and Sobrero in particular, two young Italians, I really rate these guys. Battistella, he won the controversial uh, under 23 world championships in Yorkshire when Nils Ekhoff was disqualified. He's still just 22 and I think he could be a pretty strong rider in the Cobble Classics and perhaps the Hilly Classics as well. He can finish quickly. He beat the likes of Tom Pickock in that sprint in Yorkshire back in 2019. So Battistella for me is perhaps the one to watch of the new signing. Sobrero as well. I think he's a good time trialist. So we'll see what he can do this year as well. Uh, what do you make of their incomings as well, Guillaume? Do you rate the same guys as me or is, or is there anyone else you have your eye on in particular? No, my eye is well and truly on Samuele Battistella. Um, I think it's, I think it's a weak transfer window from them. Um, we we'll talk about Vlasov in in the in the upcoming minutes. Um, but there are rumors that Vlasov could potentially uh, head away from Astana, and uh, I don't think that window is particularly reassuring for him, uh, as to. The signings are not on par with a World Tour team, in my opinion. It's good to bring in youngsters. Um, do not get me wrong, it's very good. However, I would have liked to see maybe one proven rider in that bunch. I think here, the, the most proven rider is either Battistella or Debod. And I just, I'm not sure they're currently World Tour level. They're young, they can still progress, that's for sure. Um... But the rest of, like, the, the, the other riders, apart from the NTT guys, 
Piccolo, Fedorov, Vrusensky, Perry, and Romo. I'd, we don't really know a lot about them. They haven't really proven anything. And um, for a team that's aiming for 30 wins, having lost Miguel Angel Lopez, uh, I don't know if it's ambition or delusion. <laughs> it's a fair point, I would say. But we don't know what these guys are yet. Javier Romo, he won the national championship of Spain at under-23 level, uh, coupled with, of course, Luis Leon Sanchez's uh, elite men's Spanish champions win, uh, the first time he won that jersey. So they have both the under-23 and the elite men's uh, champion of Spain in their ranks. And I've heard good things about this man, but I'm not going to pre- uh, pretend I know too much about him. It'll be interesting to see how he does. Perry... Fedorov, Brzezinski, like you say, I don't know enough about them to really comment and we'll see how they progress to World Tour level. Who knows, some of these guys could be real gems and instantly make an impact. Um, but besides Batistella, Sobrero, maybe Zabod, as we mentioned, I tend to agree with you. It's a fairly weak transfer window, uh, particularly setting a 30-win target as Vinokurov has done supposedly. So, um We'll see. I'd have liked to have seen a couple of bigger names for sure. Looking at their 2020 signings, to be fair, it wasn't too dissimilar. They signed a few un, um, undiscovered guys, if you will. The likes of Vlasov, of course, Harold Tiada, Vadim Pronsky. Um, and those guys seem to have transitioned fairly well. They did sign some elder riders too, though, like Fabio Fellina and Davide Martinelli. That's what they haven't done this season. So perhaps some worrying signs for Astana Premier Tech, but all to come. We'll see how they do. I think one of the other factors is uh, the team is obviously Kazakh and trying to get some uh, riders from Kazakhstan. Uh, And maybe there's not the new Lutsenko or the new Vinokurov yet. Uh, I I have a slight interest though in Yevgeny Fedorov. I do believe he had done well last season on the tour of Langawe uh, back in Malaysia in March, I I presume. Uh, And he... You've mentioned Batistella as your pick of the bunch. I said I also counted on Batistella, uh, but I do keep my eye out for Yevgeny Fedorov. One of Astana Premier Tech's big objectives then, heading into 2021, is the Giro d'Italia. And Alex Vlasov has revealed it is going to be his big objective, at least in the early parts of the season. And we did see Vlasov's first World Tour, uh, first Grand Tour action sorry, last year. He was at the Giro, like I mentioned. Then he went to the Vuelta, where he showed himself a lot more and was able to compete for the entirety of the race. He was there at Lombardia. We know we know this man can compete on the climbs. Can he win a Grand Tour, though? Because he has set some big objectives for himself. Like I said, I was at the Astana team presentation, and Vlasov did say he is aiming to be on the podium, even to win the race. He has big goals, big ambitions for himself. Uh, the young Russian, still 24 years old. It's going to be perhaps difficult, but we have seen in recent times, as we know all too well, uh, youngsters, Bernal, Pogacar, doing very well and winning Grand Tours. Could Vlasov be the next of those guys? What do you think, Gil? I think the ambition um, has a decent reasoning behind it. He's shown last year that he can be, on his day, a very, very good rider. Now, uh, he's targeting the Giro, and I feel like that could be a tough decision. Do I think he's got the legs to win it? Potentially, yes. Can he podium it? I'd put my money on that. However, the competition on the Giro next year might be even tougher than the one we'll have on the Tour de France. We're going to have Bernal, Buchmann, Nibali, Pino, Simon Yates... Bauke Molama, Mikel Lander, the title holder in Telge Gernot, Remco Evenepoel. That's already nine names. If you add Vlasov, that's ten riders that all want to compete for the same jersey. I feel like that could be a very, very, very difficult task for the young Russian. Um, but again, as I said, I do rate the ambition. Um, I think... On his day, he can be potentially better than like a Nibali or even a Simon Yates. Uh, but if everyone's at the same level of fitness, I think he might just lack a tad compared to a Bernal or a Buchmann or even in the time trial efforts where he doesn't have the same uh, kind of, uh, of abilities 
as for example Remco Evenepoel who will make hopefully his Grand Tour debut on the Giro. So I'm very interested in seeing what Vlasov will do but it's good that he has decided to solely focus on one Grand Tour and no go for 70% on the Giro or 30% on La Vuelta. He is 100% committed to the Italian three-week race and uh, I genuinely am intrigued and uh, very, very hyped for his performance. I'm really intrigued as well. He's very much an unknown quantity, I still feel. I know he showed himself at the Vuelta last year on climbs like the Anglery. Um He was quite offensive. He attacked quite a lot as well. Um, towards the beginning of the season, I remember he won at the Tour de la Provence, which really took guys by surprise because he went solo. Everyone thought, who is this guy going up the road early? And they didn't get near him in the end. So everyone knows who Alex Vlasov is now. But going into this Giro, I think he's still one of the biggest unknown quantities. I'm not quite sure about his time trialing ability. Of course, he's nowhere near guys like Remco. But if you compare him to even Egan Bernal, Emmanuel Bookman, these guys are fair time trialists. I'm not even sure if Vlasov is to their level. So I can see him losing quite a bit of time compared to the other guys in the time trials, if I'm honest. But on the climbs, who knows what this man can do. I really feel he is super talented. And like you said, I wouldn't bet against him podium, uh, podiuming the Giro d'Italia this season. But it's going to be a very difficult task because the start list very much is a heavy start list at the Giro this year. With the Tour de France having quite a lot of time trialling, a lot of the purer climbers have gone to the Giro instead. The likes of Bernal, Thibaut Pino, a really big name going to the Giro instead of the Tour de France this season. So it's going to be tough for Vlasov, but I'm really, really excited to see what the young Russian can do. I was looking at uh, some of his time trial results last season. Um, on the final time trial of uh, Tirreno, which is a 10 kilometer flat time trial, he finished in the same time as a Tauke Gunnart, uh, a minute behind the winner. And on the Vuelta time trial um, at the Mirador de Azaro, which had a 2.5 kilometer hill towards the end, uh, he lost two and a half minutes on Primo Roglic. So he's far from being the best, uh, but I wouldn't consider him the worst. I would potentially put him ahead of Miguel Angel Lopez, uh, who we've known as a very decent climber, but not the best in time trial, or actually one of the worst, if we take a look at his recent performances on Grand Tour time trials. But yeah, you've mentioned the competition on the Giro being very tough. I was actually looking at the competition of Vuelta for next season as of what we currently have uh, for information. And um, with Lopez, Pogacar, Uran and Valverde, uh, and Almeida, Chicon and Groschartner as well as contenders, I would think if you put Vlasov on the Vuelta with that start list, knowing that Pogacar will have done the Tour de France a couple of weeks prior to La Vuelta, I do believe that Vlasov could win La Vuelta. That's an interesting, very interesting statement. I expect, though, we may well see a few more names on the Vuelta start list um, at the time. I expect some guys who ride the Tour and some guys who ride the Giro as well will also go to that list. But like you say, it's very interesting. Um, personally, I've got my eye on Joao Almeida for the Vuelta um, later in the year, but that is for a different podcast, I would say. Vlasov, it's going to be tough to get on the Giro podium, but he can do it, I'm sure. It is impossible to mention Astana without speaking of Kazakhstan. And when you think of Kazakhstan in cycling, you think of, well, first Vinokurov, but now you think of Alexey Lutsenko. He is one of the most complete riders there is in the peloton, and as he is turning 29 in this upcoming 2021 season, uh, I think he is becoming one of the uh, most settled riders in the peloton, and... You know that wherever he is, whatever the terrain, Lutsenko is someone to watch out for. Uh, he's shown it by winning on the Tour de France last season. He's won on the Vuelta. He's won twice the um, general classification of the Tour of Oman, uh, a race which has a mountain finish at the um, at the Green Mountain. He's also a former uh, under-23 world champion. He is a rider I genuinely enjoy watching because he's quite unpredictable and uh, will always try to go for an attack here or there. Uh, last season, he was actually the leader of the team uh, when Astana headed to the Tour de la Provence, where Alexander Vlasov had his breakthrough race, if uh, we can call it that. The thing is, I don't really know what to expect and what to make of him. Uh, he's 
an early season rider, but with the um, races in uh, Saudi Arabia and Tour of Oman being cancelled, um, with main, most of the peloton starting either the Tour de la Provence or in Burgos, uh, we'll see how that affects his progression. But on his day, I think Vlutsenko could potentially challenge for an Ardennes Classic, especially with the season starting later on this year. So it will be very interesting to see what the champion of Kazakhstan does. It will be. And like you said, he is definitely one of the most complete riders in the peloton. He can win on hills. He can win on cobbles. He can win on mountain climbs as well. If we look back to the UAE tour at the beginning of last season on uh, Yebel Hafit, I believe he was right there on two occasions, right with Pogacar, right with Adam Yates as well. And he really is a danger. There's almost no race you can write him off from, apart from probably the GC of a, a Grand Tour. Even the Dauphiné, Paris-Nice, races like this, you could see Lutsenko winning because he's just so complete. He can take time at a bonus sprints as well because he can sprint fairly strongly. And this season, it seems he will again lead the team at the UAE Tour. Um, he has the likes of Paris-Nice as well on his schedule. And he also has a fair few cobbled classics. He's going to the Ronda, which I guess will be a focus for him, and the Ardennes before building up to the Tour de France. So he's trying to, he's trying his hand at almost everything. So it's great to see Lutsenko. And he won't be the favourite for any of these races, but he'll definitely be up there as a name to watch in all of these races, I'm sure. So he's a rider I really enjoy watching as well. I wouldn't bet against him winning yet another stage at the Tour de France this season. And who knows, maybe an Arden Classic as well. Even a Cobble Classic. I remember in 2019, he was right there in the final of Omelette Pet Newsblad. In the end, he had to settle for fourth place that day. I think it was Zdenek Stibar taking the win. So, Lutsenko, one to watch for uh, for sure for Astana Premier Tech. And the last point I will add uh, about Lutsenko before moving on is that I think that out of the entirety of Astana's roster, he might be the one that benefits the most from Miguel Angel Lopez's departure because that gives him a free card on some one-week races, such as Paris mainly, where he might actually try to go for GC, uh, which is something he potentially could not have done in uh, the last few years where uh, he had to work for Miguel Angel Lopez. That's a fantastic point. And even at the Tour de France, I know Lopez went to the Tour last year. I think he's planning to go back this year with Movistar, Lutsenko doesn't have to work for him. He now has the full license to go for stages um, and do as he pleases. Who knows, he could go for the mountain jersey um, without a GC leader at that race in the form of Miguel and Hal Lopez. I think it would be fair to say the strongest rider for Astana last season and probably in recent seasons is Jakob Fulsang. Overall, he's been a very strong rider, probably one of the best punchers in the world. He won Liège, Baston Liège back in 2019, Ulombardia last season as well. I think he'll be disappointed though with his Giro d'Italia performance. He was sixth overall in the end um, in Italy, definitely going in as one of the favourites for the race at the Giro. And we know it's an Olympic year. Fulsang has set the objective, a big objective, his major objective for 2021 as the Olympic road race. He was the silver medalist behind Greg Van Avermaet back in Rio five years ago now um, and of course he's looking to up that to gold this season on a parkour in Tokyo that potentially could suit him but the interesting point for me regarding Fulsang's early season comments is he's going to go to the Tour de France but he has said he categorically will not be riding GC at that race. Perhaps he's a bit disheartened by his Giro performance? I'm not quite sure. What do you think? Do you think that's the right decision by Fulsang to completely forgo GC from the beginning and purely focus on, on stages. Jakob Fulsang is, for me, the strongest rider in, uh, in Aston's lineup for, uh, for 2021. And um, he's now 35. He's never managed to get a, a very decent performance on, on the GC of a Grand Tour. Uh, I think the Giro last year probably was one of his best shout with... Um, I mean, finishing in sixth place, in my opinion, was potentially a bit disappointing. Um, he had, prior to that, finished fifth of the World Championships, so he was in shape. Uh, but maybe towards the end, uh, started to, um, well, to to crumble a little bit, which I think, in my opinion, could be a bit disappointing uh, from the, um, the Geneva-born cyclist. Uh, however, he's won the Dauphiné, he's won Liège-Bastogne-Liège, 
Uh, he's won Lombardy at Arcea, which was one of his best wins. Uh, and he is a runner-up in the uh, latest Olympic race. I think he's targeting the Olympics next year. It's interesting to see that Astana has a lot of riders that could actually target the uh, Olympics. We've talked about Lutsenko before. He could be a wise shout as well for, uh, for the Olympics, should he focus on them. Um, but uh, I think L uh, Fulsong has now realized that he cannot compete with the likes of Bernal, the likes of Pogacar, the Primo Roglic. I think he's not in that conversation anymore, but he is still a very able rider. And as soon as the road goes up, if it's small hills, I think he's looking maybe for a second win on Liege Baston Liege, which could be understandable. He definitely has the legs to, to go and win them. Um, if he goes solely for the stages on the Tour de France and doesn't focus at all on the GC like he's mentioned, he's one of the biggest threats I think there is when a breakaway goes to win. Oh, for sure. And looking at his comments at the team presentation, he effectively said, you need the team and support around you. And teams like Ineos, they have three times the Astana Premier Tech budget. And that's how it is. And it's, it's very difficult to ride a GC race uh, when you don't have the full support of a team like Ineos, Jumbo Visma even nowadays. Um, perhaps Pogaccia is uh, exclusive in that he perhaps won the Tour de France without the strongest team at the race. But also, Fulsang mentions that he really wants the possibility and the opportunity to rise and attack stages he feels suits him when he's feeling good and he doesn't have to hold back in the GC battle. And it's a very fair point, to be honest, and an interesting one to me because Fulsang... Uh, forgave 21 stages, 21 days of racing at the Giro last year, and he got a sixth place. For sure, if he dropped time earlier in the race, if he dropped half an hour on stage one or stage two, he could have won a stage, he could have won two stages, he could have won even more stages, um, and that would have probably been a more successful race in Fusang's eyes. So it's very interesting that he's doing that. I think it's it could be a wise decision as well because I don't think he can beat Roglic. I don't think he can beat Pogaccia at the Tour de France. Um, so I think it's a wise decision from, from the Dane. And one race that I would pick out as being very intriguing on his schedule is the Ronde van Vlaanderen, and the Tour of Flanders, which he rides for the second time in his career. He only rode it in 2016 in support, I think, of Lars Boom that day. So... It's his first time going to the race as a potential leader. And to be honest, I think it's a race that could really suit Fulsang. We've seen him on the cobbles at the Tour de France before, where he performed very strongly alongside Vincenzo Nibali. So we know Fulsang can ride on the cobbles. We know he can ride in the hills as well. The Tour of Flanders could be a race that suits Fulsang a little more than I think people would expect. Absolutely. The best example for me to showcase Fulsang's ability at doing well on the Ronde is Julien Lafilippe. Um, Julien, last season, set his mind up to going for the Ronde and going to, well, trying to win it. And if it wasn't for a crash, I do believe that Julien would have had the legs to go and follow Mathieu van der Poel and Wout van Aert. Um, and it strikes me that it's a classic that suits maybe... A bit more than people think, uh, the um, well, the, the actual classic riders that aren't necessarily the best in cobbles. Um, so a rider that would target Liège Baston Liège could actually target the Ronde very well. Uh, and it's interesting to see that he's going for a leadership position with Astana on these races. Astana does not have anyone really that can challenge when it comes to uh, to cobbled classics, so he won't have to think about any leader or anything like that, uh, so definitely an interesting factor here from um, from the uh, the Dane. And something else to come back on your, your Grand Tour points, he's joined Astana, I believe, in 2013, and uh, either rode a Grand Tour on the Vincenzo Nibali's leadership, sorry, or uh, as his own. And he's now 35, that's been seven years, that's going to be his eighth season here with Astana. He's only got one Grand Tour win in his entire career. That is absolutely shocking considering the level he's performed at over the past couple of years. So for him to target the stages this year, I think for breakaway riders such as, I don't know, like a Thomas de Rentz or a Warren Wargill, this is a very, very bad news, but it's a great news for us cycling fans. I cannot believe he's only won one 
one stage at a Grand Tour. That is shocking to me. Um, a rider of his his ability, clearly. I'd have certainly expected quite a few more wins, so uh, never too late to add a few. The second rider I will touch upon here is Yoni Zagiri. Um, he is now 31. He has won Itsuria uh, the season prior to, uh, to the pandemic. He is a very decent GC rider, uh, the former Bahrain and movie star rider. I feel like it's a very similar situation to a Lutsenko, potentially. Less complete, most likely, than, uh, than the Kazakh. However, he knows how to win. He's won on this year's Vuelta. Uh, I believe he had to GNF on, uh, on this year's Tour de France. But overall, it's always a decent season from, um, from Yonis Aguirre, always performing. Uh, I believe his 2016 season was actually one of the best he's had winning on the Tour de France uh, as his breakthrough win in Morzine, uh, but also becoming time tour champion of his own country, finishing 8th at the Eneco Tour. Uh, I believe he's even got a top 10 on the Olympic Games, which once again could be a race some of the Aston riders are going to focus upon um, this 2021 season. Yeah, overall, Isagir is a rider I'm always going to watch out for because you know that when the road goes up, it's very likely you'll see Isagir on the road. He is definitely one of the strongest breakaway stage hunters at Grand Tours, I feel. I can't see him targeting a Grand Tour to win in his career, in the GC, but certainly the one-week the one week races, for example, like you say, it's really a Basque country. He is from the Basque country himself, so um, that is one of his favourite races, and I believe he will go on and target it again this season. And he is fairly versatile on the one-day races as well as the stage races. When we look back to 2017, he was in the top five in Liège, Baston Liège, so... He really is a fairly complete rider on the hills and on the climbs and a rider you definitely can't out, uh, can't count out in many different types of races. And even his, I think, elder brother, Hawke Izagiri or Gorka Izagiri, he is fairly similar as well. Perhaps not so good on the longer mountains, but both Izagiri brothers are definitely guys you have to look out for. Um, in that Astana jersey. Oh, 100%. It's always a package deal. When they go from Movie Star, they both go to Bahrain, and then they both go to Astana, kind of like the, the Schleg brothers a couple of years ago, or Yates until this season. Um, and yeah, Gorka being maybe a, a bit faster, in my opinion, on um, some terrain that, um, than uh, Eon, but Eon being better when the road goes up. Uh, yeah, they, they actually complete each other very well, uh, which is quite funny for, um, for the two brothers. But um, yeah, definitely two brothers people will have to watch out for. Actually, I've just realized uh, Gorka Izaguirre last year finished in the top 20 of uh, of La Vuelta, which uh, I actually did not expect. For sure. And if you go back and look at Jorn Izaguirre's stage win, stage six of La Vuelta, it was actually his brother, Gorka Izaguirre, who attacked earlier in the race, opened up the race from the breakaway. Guys had to bring him in. Once they, did, uh, once they had done that, Jorn was gone for the stage win. So... You talk about them complementing each other very well. That is a perfect case right there of that. Now, we're arriving at the section of the show where we are going to mention one rider for next season. And uh, the rider I will pick for next year to do well and to... Well, the rider I will be watching most likely next season will be Alex Aranborough, the um, Spaniard having his first World Tour season last season with Astana coming from the uh, Pro Conti team of Carahural. He's a very decent sprinter, can also fight well when the road goes up. I'm not talking about winning a mountain stage uh, with the main favourites, but um, should there be a breakaway with uh, a hilly stage as there has been last season on the Vuelta, there is definitely the possibility to see Alex Aramburu doing well uh, he, I believe, got sixth place last year in a bunch, or well, in a favorite bunch sprint, um, where uh, Tim Wellens had won. I think he got third actually of the sprint behind Roglic and Groschartner. And he's always there in the final bunch when there is the ability or the possibility to go and win. Um, why not targeting some um, some classics as well for Alex Aranburu? I haven't seen much of his calendar or his uh, schedule for next season. But um, I, he definitely strikes me as a rider able to potentially win the Canadian Classics. So that will be interesting to, to watch as well. He is still young. He's 25. He definitely has uh, some room to, um, to go and progress. 
He's got a, a lot of possibility, this Alex Allenbury. He certainly does. He's a very interesting rider, as you've already explained. And the, the result that really stands out for me is that top 10 at Milano San Remo. And he can get over the climbs. He can get over the Cipressa, the Poggio. They're no issue for this man. And he really is quick in his sprints. He can compete in mass sprints. If it's a reduced sprint, he is definitely one of the favourites. I'm surprised, actually, he didn't manage to get a stage win or any win at all in 2020. And at La Vuelta in 2019, he was second twice. Is he the nearly man? Is he the guy who's always going to be there and just miss out? I'm not sure. Hopefully this year he can he can get that win. Uh, maybe at the Vuelta again. I'm sure he'll be going back for Astana Premier Tech. Um, but yeah, really quick in a bunch sprint and can get over climbs much better than almost anyone who can sprint as well as him. Moving on then, my rider to watch for Astana in 2021 is going to be Harold Tiada from Colombia. He's 23 years old. And it was his first year of World Tour last season, second year pro this year. And looking on paper, he doesn't really have any outstanding results looking at his just purely results without watching him rise. But he was riding as a pure domestique all of last season. He was strong at Algarve to start. Um, He helped out a fair amount at the Tour de France as well, showing his strength on some uh, some stages like the Grand Colombier, where he finished in the top 15, uh, despite again working as a domestique, not really given any opportunities for himself. I think he will go to the Giro this year, again to support um, Alex Vlasov. But I would really like to see Harold Tiada given an opportunity to ride for himself. I think he's a really talented young puncher. Uh, we even saw him in 2019. I think he took a stage at the Tour de l'Avenir as well. So. This man is, I think, underrated, perhaps even underrated by his own team as well. I'd really like to see Tiada uh, give him more chances in 2021. I think I've mentioned early on Lutsenko being someone, um, a favourite from uh, Muriel Lopez de Barcia. I think Harold Tirada also fits in that bunch, uh, even if he's going to have to work for someone like Alexander Vlasov, um, as, I said, uh, as you said, sorry, on the Giro. I believe also on the Tour of the Alps, uh, where they will have their um, final race before the Grand Tour. Um, but I'm pretty certain that Harold Terrada is actually going to be leading out the team in um, the Vuelta Valenciana, alongside Yonis Aguirre, uh, which has a very strong start list, as we currently can see. Um, at the time I'm speaking, I believe the race is still on for now. Uh, I'm not sure it's been cancelled, uh, but in the current climate, everything can change very rapidly. I definitely do want to see him as a leader for one race um, because he's got a very decent climbing ability that he cannot show right now and that he was maybe able to show a bit more when he was riding for Medellin. Yeah, you've said not many strong results uh, and I agree with that. Can 2021 be his year? Mm, I don't know. He's still 23, but why not this year or maybe the next year? So I think that will round out our preview of Astana Premier Tech for 2021. We hope you guys have enjoyed it. Make sure you let us know what you think of our comments and what you think as well um, in the comments on YouTube. You can talk to us on Twitter as well. All the links will be in the descriptions and the show notes as well if you're listening on Spotify. Um, And yeah, we have more team previews coming up in the next few days. So definitely look out for them. Make sure you're subscribed so you will get notified Um, of those when they are up. Guillaume, any final words? Lutsenko Olympic champion. Cheers, guys.